Thank you so much for joining everyone. This is the third installment of our webinar series on identifying and reporting spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven to IMAP invasives. Um, so thank you all for joining. Uh, if you have any tech issues with WebEx, please use the chat box and John Marino will help you out. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar about the content, you can use the Q&A tool, which is the little question mark button. And as we're getting started, I encourage you to all fill out our poll. There are two questions. Um, and so I will get started. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, we're very fortunate today to have a couple guest speakers along with IMAP staff. So we have two people from Ag and Markets who I'd like to introduce. We have Tom Algeyer the Invasive Species Coordinator, as well as Michael Giambalvo, the Assistant Horticultural Inspector. And we have myself, Mitchell O'Neill, the End User Support Specialist, and Madeline Maitino, the IMAP Assistant, who is a recent ESF grad who is doing some work with us this summer. And so today's goal is to train volunteers across the state on how to identify spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven and report uh, records of those species to IMAP invasives, and this is all to complement work being conducted by state agency staff. So we'll go through some welcome information, we'll hear from Tom on how to identify spotted lanternfly, particularly in the fourth instar, as well as the adult stages, which are both active right now. We'll hear from Michael Giambalvo on Tree of Heaven, and then you'll hear from Maddie, Madeline and I on IMAP invasives, and there will be time to go through some of your questions at the end. And so before we begin, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, invasive species work and the invasive species database in particular are a huge collaboration between many, many partners across the state. So I want to thank all of the volunteers, citizen scientists, and natural resource professionals who are participating. Um, so all of these different groups contribute data to IMAP, review data submitted, and utilize IMAP data, as well as doing actual on-the-ground invasive species management. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I wanted to note that the invasive species database, uh, IMAP maces, includes plants like Tree of Heaven, as well as animals like Spotted Lanternfly. And so we're here today because New York State has launched an innovative effort to combat spotted lanternfly using uh, volunteer citizen science mapping. And so it's a coordinated statewide effort um, between both invasive species partners like um, the New York Natural Heritage Program, Ag and Market, Parks, as well as uh, PRISMs, of course, as well as volunteers um, across the state. And so this includes anyone on the call today. So by contributing data with photos, um, you are helping complement efforts to protect New York State from invasive species. Um, so if you submit photos of Tree of Heaven, those will be reviewed by some volunteer confirmers as well as professionals. And if you submit spotted lanternfly data, that will be reviewed by New York State agency staff, particularly Ag and Markets. And so we started this project in February. And I wanted to give a brief update of how it's been going so far. So thanks to our many volunteers across the state, almost 300 grid squares have been claimed across the state. And uh, we recently surpassed 1,000. So over 1,000 records have been submitted across the street for Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven. And this includes um, not detected records. So on the map, um, you can see the red where spotted lanternfly is known. Um, but we're very fortunate to have all of these survey efforts across the state outside of the known areas um, to help us monitor the spread of spotted lanternfly. So thanks to, so much to everyone who's participated so far. And so we are going to close the polls. Um, so please fill in your last minute answers if you have a chance to. Um, and again, we'll be talking about spotted lanternfly, tree of heaven, uh, uh, learning about IMAP bases, selecting grid squares, um, and more. Um, and so the, the poll is closing. It'll just take one second.
All right, so it looks like we have answers all across the board, um, pretty much equal in every category of comfortableness, com comfort levels with uh, identifying the species as well as IMAP counts. So thank you, great to know. Um, so hopefully by the end of the webinar, you'll be a bit more comfortable identifying bottle fly and tree of heaven as well as um, uh, reporting species to IMAP. All right, and just some final notes before we begin. Um, I want to note that anyone on the call today is eligible for continuing education credits from uh, DC certified pesticide applicators, um, 0.75 credits. So there will be a link in a uh, web, in an email follow-up that will go out uh, probably tomorrow morning. Um, so make sure you click on that if you want credits. Um, and Again, you can use the Q&A function, so the question mark button at the bottom of your WebEx screen to ask questions about the webinar, and uh, the presenters will, will answer those whenever we're not presenting. And if you have any WebEx-specific issues, please use the chat box and John Marino can help you. And so first, I'm going to give it over to Tom with Ag and Markets to talk about Spotted Lanternfly. Good morning, everyone. Just getting our screen switched over here. Mitch. Um, you do have control. Uh, if it's not working, we can take it back. Okay, now there it goes. I, I clicked and it didn't advance, so I okay. I, yeah, no right, problem. Here we go. We're good. Go Thank you. Sorry about that, folks. All right. Uh, as Mitch mentioned, I'm Tom Algar, the Invasive Species Coordinator with New York State Ag and Markets uh, within the Division of Plant Industry. Um, so I don't just cover spotted and lanternfly. I cover all the invasive species that we deal with. Um, especially agricultural pests throughout the whole state. Um, one of the most recent concerns for us is spotted lanternfly, as you probably know, or you wouldn't be here. Um, currently, the, this we're gonna focus on the, the fourth instar nymph, the very colorful red, black, and white um, nymph, uh, which is the fourth instar. So, uh, so they molt four times. Uh, each time they molt, they get a little bit bigger, is an instar. Uh, and they start off very small, very tick-like, um, if you're looking at my screen now, they are about the size of the O in the word photo below the below the uh, the insect, the, the picture of the insect. Um, so they start off very tiny, and they get to be about the size of a dime. So, uh, spotted lanternfly is, is native to uh, China and Southeast Asia areas like Vietnam. It was first discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014 and has very slowly spread uh, from there since. Uh, some of it on its own, some of it with, with human assistance. Uh, a population was found for the first time in, in New York in 2020, although we did have a few one-offs that were found, mostly dead insects. Um, there were some, some egg masses, things like that, that were found here and there, uh, kind of scattered throughout the whole state, but no actual populations until last year. Uh, last spring, we, we found the first viable populations. And we, we found a few more this spring. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, they use their mouth parts, the piercing sucking mouth parts, to uh, not so much suck, but uh, it's more of a filter feeder. They use the pressure from the plants to uh, push the sap through their bodies. And they feed on about 70 different plant species. Uh, they prefer a tree of heaven or a lanthus, uh, but they also feed on some agricultural significant plants, such as grapes, hops, uh, they 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 will they have been found on apples, but there really hasn't been any damage to apple crops yet that we're aware of. Um, silver and red maples, they they will attack uh, walnuts and others. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're, the way that they feed, they kind of filter that sap through them. Uh, very similar to aphids, they produce honeydew. Uh, this honeydew is a sugar-rich substance. Uh, 
it's excrement. So it's not just sap, it's a little bit more than sap, uh, and it coats everything underneath of it. And, and the volume of spot on fly makes this uh, problem even worse. Uh, you can see this vehicle that was parked on the, on the road, uh, the entire windshield, the whole top surface of the vehicle is just covered in, in sticky honeydew, uh, which then causes the sticky substance is, is, is ripe ground for uh, sooty mold. Uh, to, to bloom. Uh, so the sooty mold becomes a problem, not just the, uh, the spot lantern fly themselves. Uh, so it's damaging or at least a nuisance pest when it comes to vehicles and, and picnic tables and backyards and, and playgrounds and things like that. Um, but also for trees. Uh, you can see the bottom left photo there. It, the sooty mold covers the leaves, inhibits uh, photosynthesis, stresses the plant, which uh, makes it ripe ground for other invasive species to come in, not just invasive species, but other pests and, and pathogens uh, that kind of prey on, on stressed plants. Uh, you can see the top right photo there, it's in the fall, lots of honeydew, lots of sunny, uh, sooty mold growing on the rocks and stems and, and roots underneath the tree. Uh, it's, it's a good survey tool, but it's also a nuisance. Um, and I, I love this photo on the bottom right where you could see someone stopped their power washing and wrote out sooty mold in the sooty mold with their power washer. Um, quite the contrast there between the clean sidewalk on the left and the and the, the messy, slippery, you know, poop-covered sidewalk on the right. Uh, so it impacts, impacts quality of life. It You know, people are going to be, you know, shy away from doing outdoor activities. And it's also an agricultural pest. So this is all around just a, um, a nuisance. Uh, as I mentioned, the agricultural impacts. Uh, here you can see it uh, gathering on apples and uh, trying to feed from the stems, although there has not been any documented uh, damage to apple crops at this point. And there have been some vineyard losses. Uh, nationally, New York ranks third in, in grape production uh, only uh, behind um, Pennsylvania and, uh, and, of course, California, which dwarfs us. Uh, we have quite the crop to protect here in, in, in New York State and in the nation. Uh, you can see the bottom photo there with, with adult spotted lanternfly feeding on, feeding on grapevines. They don't necessarily feed on the fruit, but the vines themselves. Uh, they give the fruit an off-flavored taste. Uh, there's a lot of things that feed on grapes. There's not a lot of things that kill grapes. Uh, spotted lanternfly has been shown in Pennsylvania to actually kill the grapevines, uh, which take about seven years to establish. So this is, you know, quite the large impact. Uh, nationally, New York ranks second in apple production, only second to Washington State. So again, that's that's why we're really concerned about the apples. And New York has been promoting its it's uh, New York uh, hop growing, and especially for lo local breweries. Uh, so that's just another pest that it attacks. And uh, we're, we're concerned about that expanding industry as well. So our environmental impacts, as I mentioned, uh, forest and forest products, things like maple, black walnut, um, and others. And again, you can see a, a partially open wing adult here on the right. Uh, feeding on, you can see the, the sooty mold is, is the black part, and then the uh, shiny liquidy part is the fresh honeydew. Uh, you can see how that would be a, a telltale sign in the, uh, when you're surveying. You know, if you start to see sooty mold, uh, you probably either have this or an aphid or, or some other infestation where it's, it's causing this to occur. So it's more of a, uh, a symptom than a sign. Uh, in New York and other states, you can see the, the light blue areas uh, are known populations. Um, just take note that, uh, like in New York County, you see Tompkins County there in the center and there in the Finger Lakes. It's not the entire county that's infested. It was one very small area on one property in Tompkins County, but we, we marked them county by county. Um, so, you know, don't think that everywhere in this blue line it's just absolutely inundated with spotted lanternfly, but it's not. But there is a population somewhere in that county. 
Unfortunately, that also now includes one county in Indiana uh, that was recently added, uh, and also there's one county in Ohio. Uh, but it's generally slowly spreading out. Um, obviously, from Indiana to Ohio, it's quite the gap. That was definitely human movement, not natural movement. Uh, in New York, we have populations in Orangeburg, New York, Slotesburg, Ithaca, Newburgh, which was recently found, and all five New York City boroughs. So as far as the life cycle, we'll start with the eggs. Uh, there is some variability in the color and texture of the egg masses. On the left, far left, you can see so it's kind of dried and cracking. Looks almost like mud or, or putty, like chalk, chalky substance. Uh, right in the center of the photo, you can see a, a freshly laid egg mass next to an uncovered egg mass. So they, they're not always covered. There is a percentage of eggs that are not covered. Uh, but that covering, as I mentioned, can have uh, some variability in its texture and color. Um, that freshly laid site, often they appear white and then they fade to gray, sometimes like a tan. Um, even even that site, egg site there, if you look at the top, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but right up here, there is uh, some uncovered eggs at the top of that. So they may be partially covered or completely covered like this one here to the left. Um, so the, from the egg masses, they, they begin to hatch out um, depending on the year, uh, depending on the geographic location, uh, but basically uh, end of April, beginning of May, they'll start to hatch out and you'll find the, uh, the first instars, uh, the first hatchings. Um, and th this is an expanded view, but this bottom right photo here, this black and white uh, nymph on the right side is, is perched upon a spruce needle. So you get, the, you can imagine how wide a spruce needle is. The insect isn't much wider than that, and it's getting ready to spring off um, or hop off. You know, they are plant hoppers, and they're they're quite good at hopping. Uh, so it's a very tiny insect, very very much tick-like, often confused as a tick, uh, and they'll continue to, to molt. As I mentioned earlier, they'll shed their exoskeleton three times. The fourth time, they will become this red and black and white spotted uh, nymph, so the fourth instar nymph. Um, and that's really what we're gonna talk mostly about today, uh, touching on the adults too, but uh, the fourth instar is what you'll really be finding now. Uh, some of the early adults, as you can see here, I mean, often you see pictures of spotted lion fly with the red wings and it looks beautiful, it looks like a moth. That's not really how you're gonna see it in the environment. What you're gonna see is this um, adult here with the the black dotted spotted wings, slightly pinkish red uh, showing through the, the semi-translucent wings there, the bright red eyes. And a lateral view is up here in the center right. Um, so we're just kind of in the transition area between the fourth instar nymph and, and the early adults. Uh, now that we're in, into August, uh, we started seeing those probably the last week of July. We started seeing the adults in the, in the last week or week and a half. Uh, in the southern part of New York. And then uh, the adults will lay eggs in the fall, and then we've completed our life cycle. They overwinter as eggs, not as adults. The, the first heavy frost, light frosts won't kill them off, it just kind of slows them down, makes them very lethargic. But the first heavy frost will kill off the adults, and then the eggs will persist over the winter. Um, and again, just another visual, uh, so again, we're in this fourth instar, kind of leading into the adults. You know, so I expanded that box a little bit just to show that you know, yeah, you you'll, you may see adults, especially in the southern part of the state, uh, but primarily the the bulk of the insects at this point um, will be this fourth instar. So that with the red wing pads, the black and white, very visually easy to detect in the environment. Again, about the size of a dime, um, but some of the adults are flying around. Uh, the emergence map, prediction map that we have currently um, kind of reflects that as well. If you look at the, the lime green color there, that, that light green color, 50% uh, of adult emergence is just the, the, the end of, you know, the southern end of the state here, kind of going up into the Hudson Valley uh, for this month. Um, so by the end of this month, we'll probably see more and more adults in, uh, up into the Hudson, Hudson Valley. But we're still, uh, at that point, we would be about 
Um, when they first start emerging from the when they molt from the third instar to the fourth instar, uh, there was an iNaturalist post in the last couple of days from a, 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 a user named Land Management Intern. Uh, they captured this amazing photo here of a, a third instar nymph uh, as the uh, well, I should say a a fourth instar nymph as it, it was exiting as it was ex shedding its a. Uh, Exoskeleton. Uh, it hadn't hardened off yet, so it's it's this odd pinkish clear color, uh, very alien-like looking. But that that color will quickly change to this red, black, and white dot. Um, again, this is the the chitinous exoskeleton hasn't hardened off yet, but it will soon uh, do so. And you can see it's it's perched on this very thin, um, looks like a vine. Uh, very easy for it to put its mouth parts into versus the heavier woody material that the the adult here and these fourth in stars are are, are perched on now. Um, this photo from the USDA on the right is more likely what we'll see now is you might see a few adults, but you'll see more of the, uh, the fourth in star red uh, nymphs running around. And again, the counties are Richmond, Orange, New York, which is Manhattan, uh, Bronx, Kings, which is Brooklyn. Uh, Queens, Rockland, and, and that very small area in Tompkins County. Uh, again, the fourth in-star nymphs, uh, just another view of that same photo, uh, where you would see maybe a few adults, but you know, for the most part, they would be uh, fourth in-star nymphs. Again, this is how you would see them in the environment, not necessarily with the adult, with the wings spread. Um, they're starting to congregate when they're in their early nymph stages. Uh, they're more dispersed in the environment as they mature, as they become, um, you know, fourth instar as an adult, they, they have a tendency to congregate in mass. Uh, you can see that in this photo here that they're starting to congregate, uh, kind of grouped together in mass feeding. Uh, another great photo from Pennsylvania Department of Ag uh, showing these red, you know, the, the red and white markings on the back of the uh, fourth instar. Uh, and you can see the white markings on the legs as well. And that is on a, a leaf of uh, Alanthus, so it's just about the, the width of a smaller Alanthus leaf. Well, there's quite leaflet, I should say. Uh, there's quite some variability in, in the leaflet size on Alanthus, but uh, they're, they're going to be a little bit bigger, as I said, about the size of a dime or maybe your, uh, your fingernail. Again, I mentioned massing, uh, especially on, on tender new growth. Uh, you can see here them gathering on, on tender new growth of Alanthus on the left side and how they congregate. There's even a, looks like a few uh, third instar nymphs there on the left side that haven't quite molted off uh, and join their uh, counterparts there as fourth instars. And you can also see a few here on this other twig, uh, which it also appears to be Alanthus from the shadows of the leaves behind it. Uh, Again, mostly fourth instar uh, nymphs. You might still see a few third instar with the black and white uh, markings that haven't molted yet, but they're going to start massing. So you're you're more likely to find groups of them like this than you are just ones and twos. Um, you may also see other insects with them, like here you can see the ladybird beetle here, which is also feeding, probably feeding on aphids that are in the area. Um, but they'll start to congregate, especially on the on the tender growth uh, of Alanthus and black walnut, uh, maybe some young red maple, things like that, uh, are, are excellent places to start kind of key in on uh, when you're when you're surveying and you're out there looking. Um, keep in mind that uh, daylight and weather conditions come into play especially with egg masses, uh, but even a little bit, you know, sometimes they're more glossy, sometimes they're less glossy based on the amount of sunlight there is. So they're, they're typically pretty shiny, but on a cloudy overcast day, um, you're not going to get that glare from their, from the, the waxy coating on their exoskeleton. So they might, might be a little bit more dull, uh, especially with the weather we've been having the last several weeks. Uh, so just keep that in mind. They're not always so shiny. Um, especially if they start getting covered with their own uh, honeydew, uh, that does happen as well. Uh, just keep in mind they're not always glossy, 
but they're they're pretty much easy to spot with these uh, red wing pads, the the black and white uh, contrasting colors. Um, for further information, if you need more information than what we've given here today, uh, we cooperate greatly with Cornell IPM. They have a wonderful website. The map I showed previously, the, they produce that map so that the most updated map is always going to be on their site. Um, there's, there's tabs here along the right side of their website for additional information. Um, excellent, excellent resource uh, for, for further detail. Um, the link here is active if you want to, somebody can cut and paste that or I can try to cut and paste that and put that in the chat or in, in the questions, but uh, that can be sent out as well. And uh, just to keep in mind that it's not, you know, what we're worried about is this, the, the, the adults flying around. Um, again, here in the IPM photo, you can see some adults massing uh, on what appears to be a grapevine. And that's really what we're worried about is, is uh, you know, the spread. And the coming, coming gathering of uh, you know masses of of these insects, causing damage to the you know fields and forest. Um, so my take-home messages for today: um, currently, we're looking for fourth in-store nymphs, early adults that are emerging. Um, you can find them in singles, but more likely you're going to start as time progresses, as the season progresses, you're going to find more of them massing. Um, in nymphs and often found on Tree of Heaven and wild grapevine or domestic grapes or just grapes in general. They're going to be dime size. The adults are slightly larger. They're about an inch long. Um, and keep in mind, negative survey is really, really important to us. So if you're out there looking and you don't see any, please record that information. It's, it's very useful for us because we know that it's been looked for and not found in those areas and so we can concentrate our efforts in areas that have not been surveyed. So negative is, is not always bad. Negative, negative survey is very, very good for us. Um, you know, unfortunately, we do have populations in New York. Well, in an ideal situation, we would survey and not find it. But unfortunately, we know it's here in a few locations. Um, so don't be daunted. Don't be discouraged by uh, not finding it. Um, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and please record that data. It's, it don't just record finds. It's, it's very, very important. Uh, if you're out there surveying and you don't find it, that that data is very useful for us as well. So, and uh, unfortunately, uh, this is not a biocontrol, but uh, this is really how I like to see spotted microflies being devoured. Thanks so much, Tom. That was a great presentation. It's great Thanks. to to learn those tips on how to identify spy lantern fly right now. And uh, thanks for the shout out for the not detected records because we will mention those later. Um, so I, a couple questions have come into the chat. Um, if you have any more questions about spotted lantern fly, uh, please enter those. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm at the Q&A. Please enter those into the Q&A as, as you think of them. Um, and now we're going to switch over to Tree of Heaven, the host, the preferred host plant for Spot Lantern Fly, and we'll be hearing from Michael. Hi, everyone. Tree of Heaven is also known by its scientific name, Elanthus altissima, and it's very widespread in New York and most of the eastern United States. We've been mapping the occurrence of Tree of Heaven for a few years now through different programs. And it is the primary and preferred host of spud lantern fly, as Tom said, which is why we've been doing that, because there's potential management implications for both species if we map it. Uh, but I should say spud lantern fly doesn't need Tree of Heaven to survive. It just will prefer to feed on it um, in if it's in the area where a spy lantern fly is occurring. Tree of Heaven's native range is very similar to spy lantern flies native range. Uh, it's native to China and South Asia. It likes poor soils like industrial areas, road size, um, where I took some of these photos. So generally where human disturbance has occurred, it will 
change the nutrient cycling of the soil through its root exudates and that'll make it a more hospitable environment for the tree of heaven species to spread in that soil. So it could be very hard to get rid of once it's growing and we encourage people to get rid of the tree if it's growing next to buildings because it can actually damage the foundation of a building if it's growing that close to it, like in that upper right hand photo. Tree of Heaven's been in, on this continent for a long time. A little history on how it came to the Americas uh, might help you remember the species. Uh, not like other invasive species, it was first brought here by a gardener, most likely. And you can see all the places in New York where there have been IMAP reports of the species on this recent screenshot I took. But that doesn't mean that it's not in areas where you don't see these red squares. That just means we haven't gotten a report on those grid squares. Tree of Heaven is a fairly large tree. It can reach heights, reach heights up to 80 feet. Most of the tree in the background of this photo is Tree of Heaven, and then the smaller clumps in front are actually newer trees, younger trees shooting up from the roots of the larger ones. The bottom photo is a, of a young sapling, but that could quickly grow into a large tree. Tree of Heaven is a very fast growing tree. That also means the wood can be fairly weak, so it can get damaged in storms pretty easily. Tree of Heaven has an alternate leaf arrangement. If you look at the upper right hand corner of this slide, you can see the difference between alternate, opposite, and world leaves. The alternate leaves of Tree of Heaven. Um, they're not directly across from each other, like an opposite leaf arrangement would be. So they kind of alternate up the stem or up the twig. And that's just one of the many identifying characteristics of this species. It also has pinnately compound leaves, which you could see the difference between um, different types of compound leaves in the upper right hand corner drawing. The leaves will be one to four foot long, which can also differentiate it from other lookalikes that are often, they often have smaller pinnately compound leaves. So a pinnately compound leaf is one leaf, which I'm holding here, made up of smaller leaflets. The leaflet shape is very unique to Tree of Heaven. It has smooth edges and then can have a few small lobes at the base of each leaflet. These lobes are also unique in that there are glands present at the tips of them, which are circled in red here. And those glands, which just kind of look like a little dot, emit an odor and you could really smell it when you crush the leaflet in your hand. So that's a good way to identify the tree while there's leaves on it. Flowers, which have already, the, the trees have already flowered this year and are fruiting in New York. So these are gone, but it's something to look for um, in late spring, early summer. They're pretty short lived and not very conspicuous because they're just very light colored. This is what a tree of heaven might look like from afar if you're looking at it. So the seeds um, are the giveaway um, when you're looking for tree of heaven from afar. This is a screenshot I took from uh, IMAP submission. And uh, those seed heads, they, they can be orange, pinkish, um, 
there's a range of colors that they can appear as. So they'll start off green, like in this photo on the left. And uh, they could really look like a lot of other seeds when they're that color. Um, there's other seeds with winged samaras um, that'll be green. But once they turn this pink yellow hue, that's a, a pretty dead giveaway that it's tree of heaven. And that's, that's really the showiest tree of heaven will look um, during the year is with those yellow pink seeds hanging off their the end of their branches. The seed will eventually turn brown, uh, like in that top photo, and they'll persist onto the tree into the winter before eventually dropping. And th this great number of seeds that Tree of Heaven produces is another reason that it can be so invasive. Here's a, another photo, so some, some more photos of Tree of Heaven seeds. They're very red in this photo on the right, still green on the in the left photo. The soft pith is another dead giveaway that the tree of the tree you're looking at is Tree of Heaven. Uh, this is especially helpful in winter when there's no leaves on the trees. Um, but you can use it during the summertime too. And during the warmer months, the pith will have a smell that is reminiscent of burnt peanut butter. Um, but that smell is not always detectable when it's uh, colder outside. So you could cut or break open a twig or a small branch to reveal the soft pith. And uh, <clears throat> that's, that's a very unique characteristic of tree pattern. The bark can be helpful for um, year-round identification as well. It's pretty smooth bark, so not flaky or deeply furrowed, but it has a light, shallow furrowing that's lighter colored. And the comparison to cantaloupe skin has always helped me remember the look of this bark. The photo all the way on the right is of a very young sapling where the bark doesn't yet have that furrowing but um, has a lot of little white dots known as lenticels. Uh, that, that's what the, the new growth will often look like once it turns from green to uh, a darker color. This is just what the new growth might look like. Um, it does grow fast. Um, so if you uh, chop down some tree of heaven and it starts growing again, it'll have this brownish color to the leaves when they first start to unfurl. The twig is a very identifying characteristic. I, it says here in the winter time, but also year round. Um, the leaf scar has vascular bundles all around the bottom edge. And this is also a good feature to take a picture of when you're submitting observations to IMAP. In the center, I have a picture of Tree of Heaven's twig leaf scar against the sky, and you can see the end is also very distinct. And you could use this as a identifying characteristic in the summertime too, because there might be some dead growth on the tree uh, without leaves and the terminal bud, you'll be able to see it, it. It's very blunt compared to a lot of other species. On the right, I have a comparison of Tree of Heaven to other lookalike species, um, which have slightly similar leaf scars that are kind of heart shaped, um, that have a, a bud above the leaf scar, but with walnut, the terminal bud is very different on the end of the twig. Sumac, which is a lookalike, its twig is uh, is different and its leaf scar is different because the bud will be in the center of its leaf scar. And then horse chestnut here, which has slightly similar pinnate leaves and leaf scars, its terminal bud is also very different than Tree of Heaven. It's a large, often red, resinous bud.
its number one lookalike would be Sumac, which will grow right beside Tree of Heaven in the same disturbed poor soils. Picture all the way on the right. In the foreground is Sumac on the bottom of the photo. And then behind it, towering above it, is Tree of Heaven, which can get a lot taller than smaller Sumac trees. Like Sumac will never get as tall as a Tree of Heaven tree can get. The most common uh, type of sumac that you'll see in the environment is uh, staghorn sumac, Rus typhina, which has a very fuzzy stem and leaf petiole. Um, but there's also a smooth branched one called sumac uh, glabra. So it could be either smooth or hairy. The fruit this time of year will be present on sumac trees, which is a dead giveaway that it would not be tree of heaven. It's these red spikes that'll shoot out from the ends of the branches and tree of heaven will never have something like that. And again, here's some of that Bruce Typhina, staghorn sumac, fuzzy twig pictured here. The pinnate leaves of sumac are different than Tree of Heaven because they won't get quite as long. They don't have those smelly glands at the base of the leaflets, and the leaflets are serrated. So you see the edge here is, is rougher, where a Tree of Heaven leaflet will have a smooth edge. The sap is also a dead giveaway that the tree would be sumac if it had a milky sap, whereas Tree of Heaven has a clear sap that you can't really see very well in this photo, but you can see that white sap coming out of the sumac leaf. Another look like because of the pinnate leaf and leaf scar is black walnut and Black lanternfly also likes to feed on black walnut, usually in one of its earlier life stages. Uh, it will feed, feed on immature walnut saplings. The fruit or nut of this tree would be a clear indicator that it is not tree of heaven because there are green walnuts this time of year hanging off the branches or falling from the branches. And the green hulls, when broken, will smell like citrus and contain tannins that can stain your skin and clothes. And these balls will turn to brown and uh, as the season progresses. And they'll also stain your clothes even worse as they, as they age. Our last lookalike that I'll talk about would be uh, an ash tree, which some people might mistake for Tree of Heaven because of its pinnate leaves, but the leaflets are, or the leaves are often much smaller or shorter than Tree of Heaven's would then have fewer leaflets. And you can see the comparison between this seven leaflet ash leaf compared to, I don't even know how many leaflets would be on this Tree of Heaven leaf. My take away message, as it always is, is check your trees. Um, Tree of Heaven is likely to have spotted lanternfly if spotted lanternfly is present in an area, but they can be on other trees too. And uh, when you're checking your trees, please re report your negative findings to IMAP. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, so yeah, so thank you to Tom and Michael for teaching us how to identify these species. Now we'll talk about how do we actually get that information into the database when you search for a species and you maybe you find it or you want to report that you did not find it. So we have that not detected information. 
So um, this is where IMAP and Maces comes in. Um, and I wanted to note that IMAP and Maces in New York State is administered by the New York Natural Heritage Program. Um, that's where I work. So our mission is to facilitate biodiversity conservation in New York State by providing information and expertise on rare species and ecosystems to natural resource managers and other conservation partners. Um, so NYNHP does a lot of work on rare species, but since uh, rare native species in particular, but since invasive species pose such a threat to biodiversity and rare species, we also have um, the Invasive Species Database Program within NYNHP. And uh, that's the part of NYNHP that I work for, um, and we manage IMAP Invasive. So, um, as some of you are probably familiar with, um, IMAP Invasive is used by several states and provinces across North America. In New York State, it's the Centralized Invasive Species Database to support PRISMs, state agencies, and other partners working on invasive species issues. Um, if any of you are, are not aware of what a PRISM is, that's uh, New York State has eight partnerships for regional invasive species management. Um, so I highly encourage you to um, look up which prism you're a part of or which prism you live in um, and connect with them. Uh, look at their website. They always have a lot of great um, information and a lot of great uh, efforts going on. Um, and so in IMAP Mesas, you can track species distributions and generate reports. Um, that's very useful to go into IMAP and see where Tree of Heaven is in New York, for example. Um, People can set up early detection alerts for species and areas that they care about. Um, and you can also do a number of other things, including tracking control efforts and results. So there are a couple of different types of data within IMAP invasives. Today we'll focus on the first two. Um, so presence data would indicate that you found a certain species. Not detected data would indicate that you searched the area, but you did not find that particular species. Um, so we are encouraging people to enter both presence and not detected records for Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. Um, and then the third type of data in IMAP invasives is treatment data. So that's if um, you managed an invasive population, um, you can record that you treated it. Um, but we're not going to focus on that today. And so for the presence data, there's actually really two categories of presence data. Um, so most of the, the records that come in have a photo attached, which is really helpful. So we have people review those photos, and if the photo matches the species listed, um, then we can confirm that record. Um, and then unconfirmed records are records where we have not done yet done that yet. So uh, all records come in as unconfirmed, and then once we review them, then we can confirm them or correct any issues. And I do also want to mention a caveat that although almost all of the data in IMAP invasives is um, available for you to see, there are a couple um, high priority species with uh, regulatory concerns which are hidden at this time. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to see spotted lanternfly distribution data, you actually would not be able to see it on IMAP Invasives, um, but Ag and Markets staff are able to see it on IMAP Invasives through their accounts. Um, you would have to go to the ITM website that Tom mentioned to see spotted lanternfly distribution data. And so confirmation is one of the key, key areas where the email alerts come in handy. So uh, for new reports of species to IMAP invasives, those all come in as unconfirmed. Um, for regulated or high priority species, it goes on this one track where email alerts are sent to state authorities um, and who then have an expert verify the record and then set the record to confirmed in IMAP invasives. Um, and then at that point, uh, depending on the species, um, it could send out email alerts to um, more people now that it has been confirmed. And for spotted lanternfly, those experts are the Ag and Market staff, including the two on the call today. 
And then for other species that are maybe uh, still priority but not as high priority as something like spotted lanternfly, uh, maybe don't have the same regulatory nature, um, something like tree of heaven, for example, those are reviewed by us at IMF Invasives as well as a wonderful network of confirmers across the state who then review those records. And so I wanted to describe where this project came from and how Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven and IMAP all this whole project came about. Um, so the motivation is that New York State needs to monitor Spotted Lanternfly and by extension its preferred host, Tree of Heaven. Um, to do that, we need more eyes on the ground. So New York State is huge. Um, there's there's just a lot of area that we couldn't possibly cover just uh, with agency staff alone. Um, we kind of need to direct agency staff to the highest priority areas where uh, infestations have already been detected in many cases. Um, so we just really need more eyes on the ground. Um, and we acknowledge that uh, volunteers and the public across the state know their local areas best. Um, so you know your parks, your favorite trails, your backyard, et cetera, and you will know if some, some new invasive insect has popped up uh, earlier than um, we would in, in terms of your, your own local areas. Um, and we need this data in a centralized database. And so in order to try to accomplish that, we realized that what we need is a group of trained IMAP invasive users across the state who survey for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven in their local areas and report their findings to IMAP invasives. So we are essentially asking participants to claim a location to survey, which I'll talk about in a little bit and then to check for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven at multiple points throughout the year, and then report presence and not detected records to IMAP invasives. So we came up with this four-step process, which you can see in detail at nyimapinvasives.org slash SLF, but I'll also go through some of this now. So step one is setting up an IMAP invasives account. Um, so, uh, to start, I want to mention that there, there are two main components of IMAP invasives that you will likely use. So there's the online web application. Um, this is where you can access the database and uh, access pretty much all of the functionalities of the um, IMAP platform, but you do need to be connected to internet, of course, because it's an, it's an online web application that you get to through your web browser. Um, and those are the recommended uh, browsers on the right-hand side. Um, but there's also a mobile app which kind of uh, slims down the functionality um, and just offers the, the really quick data collection functionality that you need. And the real benefit is that it's functional outside of connectivity. So you could take that, uh, you could be out on the trail and just take out your phone and record an invasive species um, without internet connection and then just upload that later. So first I'm going to talk about the online portion because that's where you create and set up an account. Um, so I'm going to show a brief demo of how to get to IMAP Maces, how to navigate the interface, and how to record a record online. So the first thing you'll need to do is go to our website, nyimapinvasives.org. Um, there's a lot of resources on our website um, that you can look through, including our self-guided training materials in the training tab. But, and you can access the Spotted Lanternfly page by clicking the Spotted Lanternfly button. But to access the database, what you'll need is to click that login button at the top right, even if you don't have an account yet. And so that will bring you to the login portal. So if you already have an account, you can uh, enter your credentials in at the top. Um, you can even reset your password. Um, your username will be your email. Um, and if you don't have an account yet, you'll use the sign up box below. So enter your name, email, create a password. And for a jurisdiction, most of you are going to select New York. It's just the state or province where you'll be collecting data. 
um, and then hit join and you'll get a pop-up that tells you to check your email. So make sure you go into your email and find the message from IMAP Invasives. There will be an, uh, a link to our user terms and conditions, which you will have to click to and then accept um, in order to activate your account. So if you're not seeing an email, uh, make sure to check your spam or junk folder because it sometimes ends up there. Um, you really need to, to follow that activation link to activate your account and be able to log in at the top. Um, so once you log in, the first thing you'll see is uh, this notification of whatever the last update to the interface has been. Um, so once you're caught up, you can close that out. Um, and so IMAP Invasives is a very map-centric platform. Everything centers around this main map with all the data. Um, those hexagons you see with orange circles indicate where invasive species have been recorded. Um, and you can see there's a couple of jurisdictions across North America that use IMAP mesas actively. Um, and so those orange hexagons uh, indicate uh, how many invasive species are recorded. And so there's the navigation tools on the left-hand side, the main menu in the top left corner where you can find your person ID. Um, there's the action tools on the top of the screen. And there's the layers on off layers on off all the way at the right. So I zoom in to New York State. Um, you can see the orange indicates records for any invasive species. Um, so we track several hundred in New York State. Um, and the larger orange circles mean more invasive species records. Um, so say you want to look at the distribution for just one species, you go into the filter records tool. And there are a number of things you can uh, filter on, but the, the main thing people use is species name. Um, and I recommend you always use the jurisdiction species list. So toggle over to New York and then type in the species you're interested in. So this example is Tree of Heaven. Select it from the dropdown and then apply filter. And uh, so you can switch the base map. So to make the distribution more clear, for instance, I switch it to the light gray so that it's very easy to see. And then you'll see that the data has filtered to just Tree of Heaven. Um, so you can see uh, where that is found across New York, as well as our neighbor to the south, Pennsylvania. Um, and you might, might notice these gaps. Um, where we're not necessarily sure whether or not Tree of Heaven is there. Um, is it not there? Have we just not looked yet? Um, so this is where the not detected data comes in handy. And you can actually view that on the online platform. So in layers on off, you can toggle on not detected species. And uh, once I toggle that on, it will load in some yellow points, which will pop up throughout the state. And that will start to tell us um, where we have searched for Tree of Heaven and not found it. And so you can see it fills in some of the gaps, but there are still a lot of other gaps where we're not sure. Um, and that's why we really appreciate everyone who's participating in this and helping fill in our uh, data gaps. Um, so say you want to report an invasive species to a particular area, I would suggest entering your address or town into that magnifying glass button on the left-hand side to navigate to a specific location. Um, and you might notice that the, the orange hexagons disappear and what replaces them are these green points. So these are, the, these are the actual point data for invasive species, which you can only see once you've zoomed in far enough. Um, so I'm zooming into a specific area in Albany to report a hypothetical invasive species. Um, so the tool that we're going to use is the create record tool at the top. So if you click that, um, and this is somewhere where you might also want to switch the base map. So for instance, if you use satellite, um, you'll be able to really see uh, where, where you are on the ground and be able to use uh, land, landmarks to indicate the correct location. So in the create record tool, make sure you pick presence or not detected if you're doing a not detected. 
and then you'll be prompted to drop a point on the map or enter um, coordinates, and you could also do a polygon or a line if that's what you want to um, record. And so for present species, I'm selecting our fake species um, just because it's a test. You're, you're welcome to use that to test out the system as well. Um, the online creation record creation tool will autofill your your name because you're logged in as well as the date and then a very important thing to fill out is to add a photo so again this is how most records are confirmed um, so we really need that photo of tree of heaven uh, to make sure it's not actually sumac or something um, so that we can confirm the record um, so photos are super important uh, you'll be able to add those from your computer if you're on your computer or if you use the online website on your phone you can um, access your photo library. And there are also a number of other fields beyond this, um, but they are not as essential. So really you just need the species, the location, uh, your name and date, and the photo. Um, but if you want to fill out extra information like distribution, you're welcome to do so. It's just all optional, so you can feel free to skip through it if you're not interested in doing that. Um, once you're content, the, the next thing you do is click Next at the bottom right corner. Um, once you make sure all the, the details are correct. And then there's a brief summary if you want to take a double check, and then you can hit Complete. And so at that point, your record has been saved. If it's something like Tree of Heaven, you'll actually be able to see your record in the database. Just remember to turn on unconfirmed because it won't be confirmed immediately. Um, for something like Spotted Lanternfly, that will actually be hidden, but our partners at Ag and Markets will be able to see that um, and use that information. Super helpful. And so that's how you use IMAP invasives. Um, but I did see one question in the chat that was like, where, where's the best place to survey? Um, New York is huge. Uh, where should we look? So we have uh, worked with Ag and Markets and other agency partners to create a grid square map. Um, so es essentially, um, Ag and Markets parks. New York Natural Heritage Program have selected one kilometer grid squares across New York State where volunteer survey efforts will be most helpful to complement survey efforts. And so we have a couple of different kinds. Uh, so the, the orange squares are called focus grid squares, which were handpicked by our conservation partners as areas where we really want people to survey. Um, we also have the blue grid squares, which are areas with public land, which are ideal for volunteers. And we have, in purple, areas where uh, Tree of Heaven has been recorded. So that's a high priority area to check for spotted land and fly as well. Um, and I do want to note that there is an alternative option. So some of you um, might want to survey in your local park or in your own backyard, and you notice there's no grid square. Um, that's actually, that's fine. We just came up with these grid squares to try to um, channel our volunteers who don't know where to survey to some high priority key areas. Um, but really, any spotted lantern fly or tree of heaven survey is useful. Um, in particular, um, we are not targeting private land in this grid square map um, because volunteers can't necessarily go to survey private land. Um, so that's one reason why you might not see the location you're thinking of. Um, so it's totally uh, acceptable and very useful to participate even without uh, selecting a grid square. And so we're going to show a brief demo of how to select a grid square. Um, the first step is to go to nyimapinvasives.org um, slash SLF. All right, so get to our website, um, either by typing in the backslash SLF or you can click the SLF button. Um, there will be an introduction of what the project is, steps on how to participate, resources, 
um, on our partners' websites like Ag and Markets and IPM. Um, a lot of useful information um, that we tried to keep short and sweet. Um, so I really encourage you to read through this after the webinar. You could also figure out which PRISM you're a part of and join their listserv. Um, and there's also some important notes and disclaimers that we encourage people to read if they're interested in volunteering. Um, so please read through that. And then the, the sign-up map, which I'm primarily showing right now, is actually at the bottom of the page. So once you look through all that information, you can actually go and claim a location to survey. So each of those grid squares um, can actually be claimed by a volunteer, um, and that can be your spot to survey. So there's a lot of uh, help information on how to use the map, uh, which I encourage you to look through when you go to sign up. Um, but here, I'll just click the launch sign up map. And so that will load up in a new tab. Um, the, the main things you'll notice are the map on the right-hand side and the find unclaimed grid squares tool on the left-hand side. And so one thing you might notice about the map is that there are no grid squares. Um, that's just because it's zoomed out. So if you zoom in on the map with the plus icon, you would actually start to see those grid squares pop up. Um, and just to give you a brief overview of some of the basic tools, um, there's map tools on the corner of the map, including a legend, if you want to see what each symbol means. For instance, what each symbol for the grid squares means. Um, and then there's the zoom in and out, as well as the home button, which brings you back to the New York view. Um, so I think the easiest way to find grid squares near you um, when you first get onto this map is to use the Find Unclaimed Grid Squares tool, and you can enter your address or your town um, and hit enter, and then it will zoom in to that area, and you can see the grid squares in that area. Um, so I encourage you to first check for any priority grid squares, so those orange ones. Um, those are where we really need uh, the most help. These are the ideal places for volunteers to go look. Um, so if you're willing to go to one of those nearby areas, we encourage you to. But if you want to survey one of these other areas, that's very useful as well. So we've got the purple grid squares, like that one where Tree of Heaven has been reported. And so if you click on a grid square, um, a pop-up will appear and you can click claim this grid square if you want to claim it. And so you put in your IMAP person ID, which is on your account page in the main menu of uh, logging in to IMAP Mesas online. And there's a, instructions on how to get that. And you want to type in your email address and your name. And then claim this grid square. And you'll get this success message with the name of your grid square. And uh, when you go back to the map, in a little bit, it would load to show that the grid square has been claimed. So it'll turn gray like that one, um, which means someone else is already covering that area. Um, so no one else is going to be able to sign up for that. And so to save your, your map so you remember where you uh, claimed, um, you can save a nice map of it. So I encourage you to switch the base map to something that works for you. Um, I chose the satellite imagery so that it's really easy to see the roads and landmarks. Um, and then zoom in, get a nice view of the map. And there's actually a print button that lets you print a PDF of the map or print it on paper. Um, and so it's useful to change the base map for that, as well as you might want to turn off or on some of our extra layers, and you can do that in the layer list. Um, but say you, you forgot to do this, you don't know which grid square you claimed uh, two weeks later. So switch to the Find My Claimed Grid Squares tab and just plug in your IMAP person ID, which you can look up anytime um, on your IMAP Mesa account, and then hit, hit apply. Um, and so that will pull up any grid squares you have uh, claimed. Um, so it lit up two little grid squares um, in the Saratoga area and the Albany area that I had signed up for. Um, so that's a good way to remind myself what I uh, committed to.
All right. Um, so that was how to claim a grid square. Um, so again, just go to nymfmesas.org slash SLF and please enter any questions you have into the chat. And so um, once you have an, you have your IMAP account, you have your uh, grid square claimed, or maybe you're not using a grid square, but you're planning on going to some specific area of the survey, um, we really encourage you to prep for your survey. Make sure you know how to report to IMAP and figure out which tool is best for you before you go out and survey. Um, so we have two main tools that'll be, mo that'll be useful to most of you. Um, one would be the online version, which you can use if you have access to internet. Um, but for going out in the field and surveying for spot and fly and tree of heaven, we generally recommend the IMAP mobile app. So that will allow you to collect quick presence and not detected points. Um, and you can do that very easily out in the field without connectivity once you set it up. And you can get a full uh, view of our tools at, NY, at our data collection tools at nyimapinvasives.org slash report and invasive. And now I'll hand it over to Madeline to talk a little bit about the mobile app to just give you a basic overview um, so that you, you know how to get started after the webinar. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Madeline, and I will give you a brief overview of the IMAP mobile app. So you can download it by going to the App Store on iPhones and the Google Play Store for Android phones. Uh, just search IMAP Invasives, and it should be in the results there. So the app should, has a kind of a three-step workflow. When you're first getting on the app, you should log in on the Preferences page, and you will need connection to log in for the first time. Uh, you type in your IMAP account information, which is the email and password associated with your IMAP Invasives account. Click on Retrieve IMAP Lists, which is basically the login button. And if you get an error message, uh, try again, and it usually goes through. Next is the actual recording of invasive species, which you can do with or without connection. Click on Add Observation in the top right. And the first thing you should do is take a good and clear photo, since it can be really hard to confirm without one. You can choose the photo from the library, and if your settings are on for it, uh, the date and location will autofill. Uh, if not, you can also take a photo right in the app using the camera, and the app will use your current GPS location. Choose the species that you are observing, and choose species detected or species not detected if you don't see it. Uh, both of these are incredibly valuable data, so please <laughs> report both types of data when you see and when you don't see a species. You can create as many records as you want in or out of connection, and you'll see them as these little yellow banners on your main screen. And each of these, oops, sorry, each of these records are still on your device and need to be uploaded to the database. You will need connection to upload them. So check all the boxes that you want to upload, and then click the little menu icon in the top left. Click on Upload Selected, and if your records disappear, that means they have successfully uploaded to the database. And I will hand it back over to Mitch. Thank you. Um, actually, can you go up one more slide? I just wanted to, I think you mentioned it, but I wanted to, to, to put another note in for it. Um, so on that uh, species, on this section, um, this is where you indicate whether you detected or not detected, or you did not detect the species. So I just wanted to give a second shout out for that, because um, that will be very important when you go and do your surveys. Um, and so that was a very quick general overview of using IMAP invasives. Um, so if you need, need more guidance on that to get started, I encourage you to go to our nyimapinvasives.org slash training page, or just click the training pad, uh, tab. And there is um, a self-guided training section. Um, and if you get stuck beyond that, you can always email the IMAP help desk at imapinvasives at dec.ny.gov, and we'll do our best to help you with your issue. 
Um, another important resource for you is the SLF page. So nyimapinvasive.org slash SLF. Um, lots of uh, resources and instructions there. And so one, one key thing I want to point out, um, which you can access on both the training page and the SLF page, is our YouTube channel. Um, so we have a lot of uh, really helpful tutorials and recorded webinars on our YouTube channel including a, a very quick playlist on how to get started with IMAP. Um, so I encourage you to check there. And so uh, step four, uh, we've gone through step one, which is setting up IMAP. Step two, which is um, uh, claiming a grid square or picking a place to survey. And step three is um, figuring out how to actually enter that IMAP MACES data and preparing. And then step four is actually going out and doing the survey. Um, so we, what we generally suggest, and this is very flexible, that within your grid square, you pick out one to three spots that are safely and publicly accessible and within your comfort level. Um, so, so not super hard to get to if you um, have concerns like that. Um, and then, so once you've picked out those three spots, you can go out and survey for Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven. We encourage you to make sure to check flat surfaces, natural and man-made, uh, disturbed areas for Tree of Heaven. Um, but remember that Spotted Lanternfly, while it does tend to, to gravitate towards Tree of Heaven, it really can be found anywhere. Um, so remember to check those man-made surfaces. Um, and then, depending on whether or not you find the species, um, use the IMAP Mesa's mobile app to report those findings. So presence records, if you found the species, um, and not detected records, if you did not find the species. And uh, remember that you have to do a separate record for each species. Um, so say you found Tree of Heaven, you'll do a presence record for Tree of Heaven. Um, but there was no spotted lanternfly in the area, so then you would do a second record, which is a not detected record for spotted lanternfly. And for those not detected records, it is very helpful if you put in the time searched, so we know whether um, you did a, so, so we just know whether it was a very deep search or more of a quick search. Um, there is no uh, specific time limit that you have to spend, but we do recommend generally spending a couple minutes uh, for instance, three to ten minutes in an area, um, to, just to make sure that uh, you're, you're giving a good thorough look and really not seeing it there. Um, and so, if possible, we do also ask people to repeat that survey. Um, so, for example, if you searched for egg masses in February, um, maybe you didn't find any, um, but now that it's August, it is possible that uh, new spotted lanternfly nymphs or adults have entered that area since you last checked. So it is, it, it would be very helpful to, to go back and check these areas every couple of months. And so the general goal that we're encouraging is try to collect 20 records in 2021. Um, so that could be 10 records of, in most cases that would be 10 records of Tree of Heaven, 10 records of spotted lanternfly. Um, so Say you do three different sites in your grid square, um, go three different times throughout the year, um, that would be just about 20 records. So that's the, the kind of thing we're searching for. And so that was everything we're covering today. Now we can start to wrap up and go through some of the questions in the uh, Q&A. Um, so now we can open the closing poll results. So keep an eye out for those. Those will pop up soon. All right, so you should see those polls pop up. Uh, please answer those so we can see how we did. Um, see if you became any more familiar with uh, identifying Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly and uh, more familiar with IMAP and bases. So I wanted to give uh, one last shout out to the PRISMs. Um, I encourage you to see which PRISM you're a part of um, and go to their website and find out about all the cool invasive species work going on in your region. Um, they do lots of great programs with education and outreach as well as invasive species management, um, early detection, and more. 
And so we collected uh, some take-home messages from our presenters and some other IMAP staff. Um, so you've already heard Tom's, it's that a negative survey is good, very important. Um, from Michael, again, it's to check your trees for spotted lanternfly. And then Jennifer Dean, the invasive species biologist for IMAP invasives, her recommendation is to review your grid map for spots that are safely and publicly accessible before going out to your grid square. Um, and then my take home message is to submit and upload a fake species record before you go out in the field um, just to make sure it's all working for you. Um, and so I hope at this point you're all ready for some detective work. So you know how to search for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven you know how to identify those species, and you know how to uh, report those to IMF invasives. Thank you all for joining us. Um, so now we'll close the poll, and it will take a, a few minutes. Um, so for anyone who's done with the poll, I encourage you to, uh, to think about any questions you have for any of our presenters. So you can ask questions about IMF invasives to Maddie and I, uh, you can ask any questions about Spot Lantern Flying Tree of Heaven uh, to the panel as well. Um, so please enter any, any questions you have so that we can get to them. And so the results have just come in. So it looks like um, People tend to be a little bit more familiar with uh, identifying the species um, and a little bit more familiar with IMAP invasives. And it looks like uh, some of you are already participating, some of you are, are planning to. Um, so that's all great information. Thank you all for filling out that survey. And so now we can get to the questions. All right, thank you so much, everyone. So now I'm gonna look through the questions. And so I see some, let's start with spotted lanternfly since that was the, the first thing. Um, so I'll, I'll direct those to Tom. Um, so the first one is, um, so what do you do if you actually find a nest or nymphs or adult spotted lanternfly? Do you bag them after reporting or what? Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute. I was I had actually just responded to that in the in the written written format. Yes. Okay. Um the best thing a couple of people actually asked that question. If it's a new area, uh an area where we don't know they exi they exist, um outside that list that I gave, um the best thing to do is take photographs for all, for all cases. Take photographs, submit them into IMAP. That will those reports will come to us. Uh, and we can react to them accordingly. But if you know it's a new area, that it's not, you know, Slotesburg or Newburgh or, or New York City, if it's one of those areas that um, outside of the areas where we've already detected it, uh, it's very important um, to hopefully capture it. Uh, the best way to do that is to put it in some sort of a container um, with alcohol or hand sanitizer if you don't have ability to do that, you can always put it in a freezer. Uh, you know, so put it in like a Gatorade bottle, a water bottle, um, and then put that bottle in the freezer for you know 48 hours or so, and uh, it'll kill the insect. And we maybe want to collect a sample of that if it's in a new area. If it's you know if you're in Staten Island where we know there's many 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 spotted lanternfly, um, it's not as important to collect them. At, um, you can certainly kill them, uh, but it wouldn't be as important to uh, collect a sample from Staten Island 
we know that pretty much every grid uh, on Staten Island at this point has spot and lantern fly. So I hope that, that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I see you've been answering a bunch of those spot and lantern fly questions in the chat. Are there any that you would like to address out loud at this time? Um, there was there was that one, and then also uh, someone asked about how far they fly. There is some variability in how far they fly, but they can they can fly several hundred feet on their own. Um, it then reports research from Pennsylvania shows that um, that they can actually fly further than we originally thought. Um, it's been documented that they'll fly from a woodland area, uh, sort of an edge growth, uh, into they have a mass flight into agricultural lands, particularly grapes, uh, and they, they'll fly a lot further than we originally anticipated. So it's it's several hundred feet, um, but I don't think it's been determined yet the distance that they can fly. Uh, it's quite far. Uh, they're also very good at hopping. They can hop about 10 feet. Uh, so they're, they're when disturbed, they'll actually jump, they'll hop, hence being named plant hoppers. Uh, so they're, they're just besides flying, they're they're very mobile in that sense. And unfortunately, the, the way they move around best is with human assistance, especially in the egg stage. So. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so now I'll, I'll switch to Tree of Heaven. I did see a couple questions focused on those. I know Michael has answered them in, in the Q&A box. Um, but Michael, are there any, any notes you'd like to share out loud from the Q&A? <clears throat> I'm looking through the chat myself. One other question that I, I think you might be able to address, Michael, is um, Judy asked what sorts of communication goes out to owners of vineyards and orchards? Um, Communication as in outreach for spy lantern fly. Yes. Uh, well, we have Cornell IPM doing a lot of that in the Ithaca area, and we have inspectors going out to vineyards to talk to vineyard owners and owners of wineries about the latest knowledge we have about spotted lantern fly. And uh, we share the map that Tom showed of where spy lantern fly currently is. Um, there is information on approved pesticides um, for the control of spotted lantern fly and tree of heaven, and also the latest research on how spy lantern fly and uh, tree of heaven relate to each other and what the best practices would be to um, control them on the vineyard like leaving whether or not to leave tree of heaven uh, in an area near a vineyard thank you uh, uh, i want to add just one thing All the the prisms particularly the finger lakes prism has a campaign targeting uh, orchards and, and vineyards, so they're looking at apple orchards specifically and, uh, and grape vineyards, um, and they're, they have outreach material that they've produced themselves. Uh, it, it's actually really wonderful outreach material. There's posters and uh, little hangers for the uh, wine bottles. They call them uh, wine stoppers, but it's like a little cardboard um, hanger that goes over the wine bottles. Um, so they're, they've been reaching out to orchards in that area. Um, not just targeting the orchards themselves, but also the consumers. And uh, they recently launched that campaign. So it's just another way that prisons are helping. Thank you, Tom. And I see a couple questions following this one theme that I, I was wondering if Tom or Michael could uh, talk about. So we've talked a lot about um, the survey efforts and monitoring spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven. Um, but some people are wondering what, what is the response? So what happens um, after something is 
reported apart from being confirmed in IMAP, um, and I know the response is very different between Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. Um, so would someone be able to talk about that, like management and response? Uh, I can talk about the Spotted Lanternfly side of it. Um, it really depends, the response really depends on the location. Uh, we're not taking a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, Ithaca is very different than, say, Staten Island, uh, not just geographically, uh, but spotted lanternfly has been detected in almost every grid across Staten Island or the Richmond County, as opposed to Tompkins County, where there's just one very small area on the on the Cornell campus with just a few, you know, a few uh, adults and a few egg masses found. So we're really approaching it site by site. So if a report comes in and it's from a known area, uh, we're already acting on those locations in various capacities. Um, uh, sometimes it's it's surveying, sometimes it's trapping, sometimes it's, it's working with some of our partners and getting treatments done. Uh, in other cases, it's monitoring the spread. Um, you know, it, for Staten Island, there's really it. it we have we do not have the resources available to formulate a control program for Staten Island. It's just too too large of an area, too too much uh, of you know a, too large of a population. Um, but we can monitor the spread. Um, so it really varies from site to site. Uh, so that's why it's really important to report these, and then we determine whether you know if it's a new area, we react one way. If it's a known area, we may react in a different way based on that geographic location. <clears throat> and as far as the tree of heaven, I'll, I'll have to pass that to, to Michael. I'm not entirely sure what reaction we would have for that. When it comes to tree of heaven, uh, we might do something like what we've done with the, the grids opening up for IMAP, uh, <clears throat> where the Tree of Heaven has been identified within a certain area, so we'll encourage the public in this situation to go survey that area since Tree of Heaven has been confirmed there. Um, prior to infestations of SLF arriving in uh, New York, we were surveying for Tree of Heaven um, and some of that data might go into mapping again where now there's an infestation of spotted lantern fly in a certain area. <clears throat> we'll want to know how many tree of heaven <clears throat> points have been plotted um, in, say, uh, a given proximity from an infestation like half a mile, a mile, and those trees might be targeted for treatment or removal. Um, and that data is helpful for knowing uh, costs of that type of management or, or how, much, uh, how much of a chemical might be needed to, to treat an area. So that, that's just some of the ways we'll use the Tree of Heaven data points that are submitted by the public. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, so, so Tree of Heaven is, is pretty widespread through most of the state, so it's, it's not really possible to manage all of it at this point. So one of, one of the big uses of that data is helping target uh, spotted lanternfly surveys more so than uh, helping us manage individual Tree of Heaven infestations since there are just so many across the state. Um, and I think as, as one last question or note, um, someone was, was asked a question about the spread of spotted lanternfly. Um, and I see someone is typing in an answer, so you will get an answer. But I will just note that one thing they brought up is something that we have also thought of and been worried about, um, that an egg mass can be laid on anything. It could be laid on a camping chair that you then put in your car and drive 100 miles away with. Um, it could be an egg mass could be laid on your actual car um, and like that sort of thing might be how spotted lanternfly got to um, started spreading into the Midwest, for example. Um, so 
Uh, do Tom or Michael have anything to comment on that sort of spread for spotted lanternfly? Yeah, that would have been me typing. I, I stopped typing when you start answering. Um, unfortunately, the answer is thousands of miles. Uh, once they, they're in the situation, like Mitch just mentioned, you know, on a piece of camping equipment, on a vehicle, on a piece of construction material, package, commercial packaging, anything like that. Um, and it's not just the egg masses, but the, the adults are quite good at hitchhiking as well. Um, they'll land on a vehicle and accidentally get in a vehicle. Uh, even, even, you know, inspections are required, but even with inspections, they can still slip through, especially cargo uh, situations for um, trucks and rail and aircraft. Um, they can literally spread thousands of miles. I mean, literally, that's how they got here, um, you know, for, from Asia. So there is no limit to their human-assisted or anthropogenic spread. Um, it, they can move, move any time of the year. Um, as an egg mass or, or as an adult, and they can move thousands and thousands of miles, so. Thank you, Tom. Um, and so I think, so we have gone a little bit over, so I think I am going to formally end the, the presentation. Um, thanks so much to our speakers, Tom, Michael, and Madeline. Um, it's really great to um, to get all these people trained up on how to identify these species and where to go uh, when they want to report the species. Um, so thanks so much for everyone attending. Um, I hope you all have a great day, and I encourage you to go out and check for spotted lanternfly and tree of heaven uh, this weekend. And so, John, you can stop the recording now. Um, I'll stand for just a second in case.